Good, okay. Thank you all for coming this afternoon on the uh, almost last session of TechEd. Uh, for those of you who have to stand up and sit down, my apologies for not quite having a big enough room. Thanks for coming anyway and persevering. My name is Glenn Condren, and I work for a small software company in Redmond, Seattle, called Microsoft. You might have heard of it before. And today we're talking about async in the context of ASP.NET. Now, the, go through a small agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of async in .NET, just how, when we added async and a couple of different flavors that helped evolve to what we've got today. I found that when I was learning about async, um, that the, having that background knowledge helped a lot. Uh, so I work for the Azure Developer Experience Group. We build ASP.NET, SignalR, NuGet, all of the server components, Entity Framework, where I work primarily on Entity Framework. And since async can get rather complicated, I spent a lot of time harassing people at Microsoft to teach me as much as they could about it. So that's what I'm going to try and share with you today, are uh, the various stories and techniques that I'd heard and I'd uh, used from the ASP.NET team. Now, after that, we're going to talk about scenarios for asynchronous programming and the effect that those scenarios have on an ASP.NET web server, where you do want to use async. And at the end, we're also going to talk about, during that and at the end, I'm also going to talk about a lot of situations where you do not want to use async because you, it's possible that if you're not using it appropriately, you can just slow down your server rather than help. But if used in the right way, it's just always beneficial generally. Okay, so let's get started with a brief history of async in .NET. So in 1.0, we had no asynchronous programming model. You guys complained and said, you know what, we'd kind of like to do some async. Maybe not you guys personally. And then after that, we added, in .NET 1.1, we added the APM, the asynchronous programming model. Some of you may have used this before. This has resulted in code similar to what I have at the bottom of the screen here. You call begin something. You get back an IAsync result. You do some work, and you just continuously poll IAsync result to find out whether or not the work's done. And then when it is done, you call end something, and that gives you back the result from whatever your asynchronous work was. This is kind of annoying. Nobody really likes doing a lot of polling. And so in .NET 2.0, we added the event-based asynchronous pattern, EAP. This, was, this resolved the issue with constantly polling your async result. This, in this pattern of programming, you subscribe to something completed, and then you do some async work, and when your async work is done, it'll call the event, and then you can do something with the result. So you didn't have to poll anymore, but you also had a very large a lack of visibility into what was actually going on. You didn't know what was happening, and that was somewhat problematic. So then in .NET 4, we added the task parallel library. Now, the task parallel library, you call something async, and you get back a task. And this task represents the work that's going to be done. Now, in a lot of ways, this is, seems similar to our very first one that we looked at in 1.1. However, the task class has a lot more features than what iAsync result does, and it lets you do a number of interesting things. For example, you could use task.continue with which then allows you to have the same advantages that you had from the event-based asynchronous model when using a programming more story more like the .NET 1.1 async story. And this was the most recent async code. And it was very good. However, it could get very complicated. So in .NET 4.5, we added the async and await keywords. And the async and await keywords are ways to use TPL without actually having to write TPL code yourself async and await would let the compiler generate the code, because hopefully, and much more frequently than not in my case, the compiler knew a lot more about TPL than I did. And so we could write better TPL code. So that brings us to start talking about async scenarios and some analogies that we like to use to try and talk about asynchronous programming. But the first thing that we want to talk about is asynchronous and parallel. Because asynchronous, asynchronicity and parallelism are related, but not identical concepts. And often these things get confused. Parallel programming is where you're going to have multiple things happening at the same time. It's traditionally where I'm writing a multi-threaded app. It's parallel. I have multiple threads. They're all executing something. They all could start at different times and end at different times. And I'm going to get results back all over the place. 
And then, to contrast that, you have sequential, which is like traditional code, where I have an ordered sequence of steps. The next step executes as soon as the first one is completed. This is your typical programming, where you don't have to worry about those multiple things, beginning and ending, and locks, and things like that, that you get into trouble with when trying to do parallelism. Asynchronous, in the context that we're talking about today, is basically where your thread is not blocked when there is no work to do. It's probably a minor typo in that slide. And this is versus synchronous, where the thread is blocked until execution is complete. So async and await are about being able to write sequential code that does not execute synchronously, or asynchronous sequential code, the top box and the bottom box. So you write sequential code that doesn't have the complexity of parallelism, but that does not block threads whilst there is no, whilst it could, can be waiting, whilst it doesn't have CPU work to do. Okay? These four concepts are kind of all very related in this area, and they're often very confused as we go. So the scenarios where you really want async is I.O. Async and await is what makes I.O. very good. This is talking to a database, talking to a file, anything on the network. Anything that's just waiting for some other thing to come back to you, calling a service. Then there's parallelism. You can use async and await to do parallel programming. And we'll show you some examples of this later. And there is actually a third scenario, which is long-running event-driven. This is where you would do streaming, where you get some data that comes in, you process it, and then eventually some more data is going to come in, and you process it, and more data is going to come in. And you don't want to have threads sitting around just waiting for more data to come in. You want the server just to kind of be able to wake up, do some work, go to sleep, right, and not keep using up resources. So this long-running event-driven is kind of complicated. I'm not really going to, do, I'm not going to show anything today, but effectively this is SignalR, for those of you who have seen SignalR in the past. Long-running event-driven is kind of what SignalR is doing on the background and some other stuff and things like that. Okay, so let's talk about I.O. operations and how I.O. operations affect ASP.NET. So when talking about async and non-async code on a web server, I like to use the analogy of a post office, which hopefully uh, translates to Europe the same as it does from everywhere that I've been before this. So thread in, a, in a post office, you have a bunch of servers a bunch of people behind the counter with a cash register or with a computer. And then people are going to come in and they're going to ask the person to do something for them. And then when that, that, that thing or that request is completed, they're going to go off. And then someone else is going to come in and ask for something to be done. And this is fine as long as there's not very many people or people don't slow, do something very slow. Sometimes what happens is, is you go to the post office and you've got something that's going to take two seconds but the guy that's in front of you seems to really want to tell the person behind the, cash, behind the computer his life story. Okay, so you're stuck behind him and you're like, I, all I need to do is hand them this piece of paper and come back, and they're just standing there talking all day. So these slow requests, typically, this is in a web scenario, this is what you're talking about with I.O. When you're doing I.O., you're that guy that's telling the person their life story. And the person behind the computer is the thread that has to process your request. So everything works fine right up until every single thread that's available in the ASP.NET thread pool is busy with you telling them your life story. At which point, every other thread, every other request that's coming in, regardless of how big or small it is, is just waiting its turn in the queue. So this means you end up in this scenario very quickly where you have 500 things running, all of which are waiting for the slow database to come back, and a thousand things that take 0.02 seconds, all of just sitting there and waiting for four seconds before they get to do their 0.02 seconds of work, because every single thread is busy. This is how the ASP.NET server, this is how your ASP.NET server is working today without using async. We, and, it, and it's fine as long as your story looks like it did at the start when there was only a couple of people, or if nothing that takes a long time is happening. This is an example of synchronous code that blocks up those servers. This is taken from a white paper that is, I have got linked to at the end, which talks about async and why we do async and how it works and the internals of it all. And we'll show a couple of samples from that paper. All this does, it takes a list of URIs, it goes and downloads the, URL, the data, and it sums it up and tells you how big all of those URLs that you gave it were. 
It's probably not that useful, but it demonstrates the concept. This download data bit here has to contact another server. And that server could take any amount of time to come back, and we don't know. And as long as it is downloading data, it can't handle any more page requests coming into your server. So when let's talk about asynchronous. So that is our post office model of handling web requests. When you convert your I.O. operations to be asynchronous, then you move into the restaurant model of handling web requests. In a restaurant model, you have a couple of people who are standing there waiting for people to come in, hence the name waiters, potentially. Then people come in, the waiters go and take care of their request, and then they either go to another request or they go back to the floor and they wait. So in this scenario, if you've got somebody who's slow, who's sitting and actually eating their food, for example, the waiter just goes back to the floor, and then they're free to handle new requests as they come in. And then they can continue through their work, and if everybody's slow, they're just standing there waiting. And when somebody has finished their slow task, they'll go back and they'll finish whatever there was. Maybe the first one, they hand them a menu, and then they take a little bit of time while they read the menu. And then the waiter goes away, and he comes back when they've had enough time to think about reading it. And then they take your order, and they go away, and they come back. Okay? And that is how ASP.NET web servers will have work when you use asynchronous I.O. operations. Now, this is the same code sample we saw before. This piece highlighted in yellow is, as I said earlier, this is our synchronous I.O. operation. This is our download data method. This is the equivalent code written in TPL. This is actually taken from that same white paper. That white paper takes that first piece of code and turns it into async and await code. This is one of the intermediary steps for TPL. Don't worry about trying to understand it if you don't need to, which will do the same thing as the synchronous code in an asynchronous manner and take care of all the error handling and the checks and the problems that can go wrong when you're doing code. This is not actually the entire code sample. It's just the only one that I could fit on a slide. So if you read this, if you go to look at the white paper, eventually you end up with a page or more of code to be able to do the equivalent to this. And what's more important for, to me is that I can look at this and I can say, I can see what the intent of this code is. The intent of the developer writing this code is to download that URL and add up the score. I have no idea what this code does when I look at it. I have to look at it and read it and understand it and compile it in my head sometimes. And what's more importantly is there's probably a bug in here, right? I don't know if there's a bug in there. It's a maintenance nightmare. So this is the code that we have. This is the equivalent code using async and await. It does the same thing as that one we just looked at with the big page. So hopefully that shows you some of the advantages of it. So those of you who are not completely familiar with async, we add the async keyword, which is the first highlighted bit there. And then instead of returning an actual value, we return a task. A, generically a generic task, so we're strongly typed result. Then we add async to the end of the method, but that's just by convention. It's not actually required to make it work. And then when we get to this I.O. bound operation, we say await, which is the equivalent of saying, thanks, waiter. Just go, go do something else now. I'll, I'll call you when I'm ready. Okay. So let's look at async in ASP.NET. My computer went to sleep. So what I have here is an ASP.NET Web Forms application. I'm just going to run it for you and give you a bit of a look at it. Uh, it's just a standard app. It has this home page. This home page is the stock standard home page that comes when you create a new template back when I actually created this project. As you've seen over the course of TechEd, it looks a little bit different now. And then it has this dashboard page. This dashboard page displays a quote up here at the top of the page. It's OK. It's already tomorrow in Australia. And then it tells you the processing time for the page. And it goes and displays this RSS feed, which at the moment is coming from my local machine, but 
could just, just goes and gets something from somewhere and comes back. Okay? The code for this is pretty simple. I'm just going to walk you through it real quick before we start converting it. So I have my page load method. And in my page load method, I'm going to use web client here to go and get the result of this quote, uh, whatever this quote service URI gives me back. I'm going to convert it to an object, and then I'm going to display set the text here on my web form. And I'm going to do the same thing with the RSS. With the RSS. I'm just going to grab the, do the same get, and then I'm going to convert the XML into an object, and then I'm just going to do the data, do some data binding here. And then I'm going to write out my processing time. So this is the deserialized RSS, just for those of you playing along at home. Just uses link to, link to XML, create an object. It's not too complicated. I use my classes to hold the data. Now, the other thing that I have in my application solution over here is these performance tests. And what these do is they run a load test on my local host, on the URL that this website is hosted at. So they 50% of the load, they simulate 500 users hitting my website for 20 seconds. Half of them, those requests are going to go to the standard static HTML home.aspx. The other half of the requests are going to go to the dashboard page that we saw with the XML and the quote and the processing time. It's going to run away. It's going to do all of that. It's going to do a little bit of warm up, and then it's going to do 20 seconds worth of load, and then it's going to come back and it's going to tell me some data. It's going to tell me how long my page took to load. It's going to tell me how many re maximum requests that I could get. So if you look here, this average page time in seconds. So av on average, it took 3.2 seconds to load that diff dashboard. Now when we went and looked at it a minute ago, it had 200, millis 200 odd milliseconds on there. But as soon as we're in load, this page is taking 3.2 seconds. And what makes even less sense, potentially, maybe not considering you know the talk that you're in, is that the home page is taking 2.96 seconds. All it is is a state, all it is is a HTML page. It's not doing anything. Why is it taking 2.9 seconds? And the reason, if you think back to our post office analogy, is that that uh, dashboard.aspx page is telling ASP.NET its life story. And our home pages are spending all their time queued up behind it saying, come on, I've got like, I've got like a millisecond of work to do. Okay, so let's go and have a look if we can do something about that because the people need us to fix the post office. So you can do a couple of things here. Some guy asked, someone asked me about this a little bit ago, so I'm just going to show you. You can actually make your page load event asynchronous if you want. You can throw async in here, you can change void to task, and then the page load event will, will, have, the page load event will happen asynchronously. However, if you do that, then the execution of the page lifecycle will stop at page load until all that asynchronous work is completed. Whereas if you do what we're going to show you today, and you just go register page async, register async task, and this accepts a page async task, so we go new page async task, and then this accepts a func that is the thing it's going to execute asynchronously. So we're going to say, give us this, and we're going to just wrap our whole load method here inside this. Okay. And then, once that happens, we're going to, once we've done that, we're going to, so this green squiggly line here, for those of you who haven't used much async, if you mark something as async, Visual Studio is going to say, hey, you've said this is async, but you haven't actually done anything that's asynchronous in here, so maybe you shouldn't mark it as async, which is what that little green squiggly line is saying. So now we need to await on something. And the things we want to await on are those things that are blocking our, blocking our, uh, our request thread, right? So we want to await on all these download strings. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is web client does have a download string, an asynchronous version of download string. It's called download task async. Okay. The reason it's called that is because it already had download string async on it. So the convention is if it already had an async thing that wasn't part of the async await pattern, call it download string task async. But instead, what we're actually going to do is we're going to convert web client over to HTTP client. This is new in .NET 4.5, and it's completely asynchronous. It only has async methods. Okay? And we're just going to convert over our, convert over our web client to use the new cool thing. Okay? 
And then this red squiggly line, the reason for that is that the asynchronous methods, they're returning a task. If you have a look here, if you have a look at our var here, our var here is a task. It's not a, it's not a string anymore that this get string async is returning. Now, if we await on those, then we're telling ASP.NET, I want you to run along now and process some more requests. I'm busy doing this thing. When this thing comes back, you can come back. We can, we can do some more work. And then when you do come back, I'm going to give you a string. Can you give that to my variable here, right? So that's all that we're going to, that's all that we need to do there. Okay. Now, let's run this. What do you think is going to happen? No. What's going to happen is it's going to explode. The reason that is, is that this operation requires the page to be asynchronous, and the async attribute must be set to true. Does anybody know what that means? Nope. Fantastic. I'll be sure to tell that to whoever wrote that message. So the default.aspx page requires an async attribute in order to the dashboard even. I said default and not dashboard. Threw me for a second. It needs to have async equals true. To tell ASP.NET to use the asynchronous pipeline when processing this web forms page. That exception, once you know that fact, that exception message makes sense and it's usually easy to, uh, to remember. But um, it might not work the very first time you start converting stuff to async. I certainly forget most of the times when I chuck some async code into a non-async web forms page. So we run this again. It took a little while to process the first time, but we run it. So this is about exactly what we were seeing before, right? A few hundred milliseconds, it runs. Nothing's different. This is important for those of you who haven't used much async before, in that we didn't change any of our client code other than having to add that async tag, right? The page doesn't know anything about the server being async. This is a server thing, not a client thing. Okay? So we'll come over here and we'll run our load test again. Now, this uh, load tool, by the way, is built into Visual Studio Ultimate. So if you're using Visual Studio Ultimate, you've got this. There is some free alternatives. There's one called WCAT, which can do something similar. It's just generating HTTP requests and sending them to my web server and collecting the data. Um, so the, if you see so yeah, Ultimate only, uh, so the, all, the, all, the lower ones, all the lower ones don't have it. So what we should see here is how having the uh, restaurant style of, AC, of, of, of handling requests is going to improve our co code run. Now, what's happened here is that suddenly we have 4.54 seconds is the average response time for our page, right? But our home page here now is it 0.074 of a second was the average response time. So people who want to look at our home page, they're happy now, fantastically happy, right? Because suddenly when you load your home page, it loads bam. When you load a slow page, it takes a long time, but you're slow doing slow stuff. You expect a page that shows 4,000 things on a page to be slow, but you don't understand why my home page is slow when I'm doing that. Okay, so you've removed the effect that the dashboard is having on the, on the other page. Now the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run this load test again. Because this is somewhat flaky, and it's because I don't actually run the load test for long enough. 20 seconds really isn't long enough to do a load test, and because sometimes my laptop starts to play up. So it might actually not work the way that I intend here. But what happens even on this laptop typically is that I add a 1 to the start of the maximum number of requests, in that the maximum requests that my laptop actually managed to process in that 20 seconds goes from about 900 to about 1,900. Okay? And it's basically because of the fault of the test and not wanting to sit here while we do a proper, there we go, whilst we do an actual long <laughs> proper load test. So just pretend like that, this, that last one just didn't happen, and everybody go, wow, right? So th what happens here is, so first of all, we do what we just said we've done, where we had 4.49 seconds and we, and we had 0 0.13. But we've also upped our, upped our, absolute, our maximum count a fair amount. Um, not as much as what it can actually do it, and it's, a, it's the fault of the, the sync today. Um, the other thing that happens is that if we compare some of our pages, then we also notice things like the average, the pages per second will also go way up. And you can run these, these tests on your own 
pages and you can play around with them and you can try them out. So you have the uh, Visual Studio Ultimate loaded. Okay. Now, let's head back to some slides. Just a few takeaways for you to remember. So await effectively frees up threads until the operation is complete. Using async does not affect the client. Remember to, so the, as we saw, we, the only thing we had to do was async equals true. Remember to set async to equal true to use the asynchronous pipeline. And use register async task to register your work that's to be done later on, especially in places like page load. What happens is that this register async task, ASP.NET will take care of when they think it's time to do the async work. And it'll happen somewhere around pre-render complete. And the other thing, we didn't actually mention this much, but we did access things like controls on my web form and things like that. And I can access the context and the request object in there. I can do any of that sort of stuff, and it works. That's because ASP.NET takes care of thread affinity. Thread affinity being how, like in Windows Forms, I can't access the UI thread whilst I'm on a background thread. But you can access the UI thread when using async and await. And you can also access, in ASP.NET, you can't access request, context.request, context.response, things like that, ASP.NET intrinsics, when you're on every thread other than the request thread in this case. Okay, so this is how, that's how we've done it in, we, in web forms. Let's have a little bit of a look at web API. Uh, in, this get quote, in this get quote here, this is actually getting from this quote service. Uh, I might need to actually switch over, right? Thanks for letting me know. The, uh, so this quote that we're displaying at the top of our dashboard page, we're going, hey, HTTP client, get me this quote service URL. So that is actually this service class that I've got here in my solution. I didn't show it to you earlier. So in here, we have a quote of the day controller. And this quote of the day controller is really simple. All it does is use entity framework. It goes and gets a quote out of a database, the first quote every single time. Pretty simple. Now, let's, how do we make this asynchronous? So the first thing we do is, all we do here is go async task quote. This is enough for Web API or MVC. MVC works the same as what Web API does to be able to make this asynchronous. I need to resolve a, um, a reference so that it can get the task type. Now, I still have my green squiggly line because I'm not using asynchronous stuff inside here. Now, I'm actually using in here, if I go and look at manage NuGet packages, I'm using Entity Framework 6 Beta 1, which is the one that ships with Visual Studio 2013 preview that you guys saw. Now, for those of you who haven't been to any of my other talks about Entity Framework 6, that's because I'm using that because one of the new features given is asynchronous support in Entity Framework. So now I'm going to say, OK, get this database asynchronously, await for that to happen, and that's it. So I can build, I can run, and I didn't have to make any changes to my dashboard, but my service still works exactly the same. And if you've done, a, if you've done a another load test, you would probably see a slight increase. It wouldn't actually be very big. Everything here is on my local machine. It doesn't actually take that long to get the quote, first, quote, first quote from a table with two rows in it on my local machine, funnily enough. But if, you saw, if there was a lot of network latency in that, you would see a significant difference. If I trusted the network, I could have done this demo across another machine, and then you would have seen a much, much, much significant improvement in your, in your throughput and request. But none of the stuff I'm doing actually takes that long. But having said that, what happened here earlier on, we saw we added hundreds of maximum requests in that, in that time, right? It went from 900 to sort of 1,200, 1,300 in those two tests that we'd done, the maximum number of pages that my laptop could handle. And that's with the only I.O. stuff being on my laptop, which is an SSD. So you imagine how much more that is when you've got to go over a network to someone else's server through 100 firewalls and 50 routers and then hit the database, and then wait for the database to finish and then come back. All right. The number of the difference in your perf is going to be directly related to how long your I.O. actually takes, because that's how long your threads are currently sitting there doing nothing for. Okay, so that was pretty simple. What I'm now, I'm going to switch back. And 
talk of the couple of little takeaways. Web API is pretty dead simple to turn in async. It's the same with MVC. Just mark your method as async and then do your stuff. And there's no change to anything that's calling it. As you saw just then, I was still just getting that same URL. I mean, I'm just doing a HTTP request. I don't care what happens on the server. I don't care how they process my quest as long as they process it. Async is transparent to callers, and EF6 enables async. So if you want to use async and entity framework, get EF6, but which isn't RTM yet. It will along with Visual Studio. So the other thing is that um, all of this stuff is on my server. So realistically, I haven't really offloaded anything here, but I've still, <laughs> I've still managed to speed things up. But really, I'm just pushing the can along a little bit on my own server. So let's talk a little bit about error conditions. All of these I.O. operations are great, but um, what happens with async when something goes wrong? Or some sort of cancellation thing happens, somewhere where I need to cancel it. So cancellation tokens in async code allow the caller to terminate an in-flight asynchronous task. So you can create a cancellation token, you can give it to those asynchronous tasks, and when you want to finish, you just say, I'm finished, I'm done. And all, any asynchronous task, task that you've passed that cancellation to will stop, will halt, and not complete, and it's, everything's finished. In ASP.NET, there are three built-in cancellation tokens. There's a request timeout token, a client disconnected token, and an async timeout token. So request timeout is a timeout, the same timeout you've always had. Client disconnected is when you can close your browser, or you're going to close the tab. And your async timeout is how long you're going to wait for an asynchronous operation before you give up and say, okay, I don't know what's going wrong, but something has. Okay, so let's have a look at some cancellation tokens. First thing we want to look at is, well, let's go back to our dashboard.aspx. And we're going to say, we're just going to say var token equals require response dot Cancellation token, if I can spell. Client disconnected token. Okay, so this client disconnected pro property on the response object gives me the ASP.NET client disconnected cancellation token. Then, uh, let's set this up a little bit better. Let's go down here. We're going to go await, and we're going to go task dot delay. We're going to delay for about 300 milliseconds. So this is an asynchronous way of delaying. It's like a thread dot sleep, except that the thread, that the, re the request thread, is not actually going to sit around while you sleep. It's going to go back and process other requests. So it's asynchronous, but it's effectively the same as a thread dot sleep, and it's just going to halt processing of this whole thing there. Okay. Now the reason I've done that is what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a breakpoint here. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. I'm going to run this page and show you the reason that we care about the client disconnected token. So we've got our we've got our breakpoint. We hit it here. We run through. Everything's good. Now, if I take this and I open up another tab, okay, and I paste it in. So we've hit our first breakpoint here, right? So I'm going to just move these pages or these windows around so you can see a little bit better. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit F5. You're going to see when I hit F5, because this yellow line here is going to go red again, because I'm going to run. Then, as soon as I hit F5, I'm going to click this cross over here and close this tab and disconnect our client. Effectively, this is the same as what happens when someone closes the page while it's still loading. Right? And then we're going to see what happens. So currently, if I go select here, hit F5, close the tab. Now, I still hit here. That happened kind of really fast. I probably should increase the delay. But I've closed my tab. But my, my, my request is still running on my server. It's still doing all this work. It's still downloading this, RS, this RSS feed. It's still doing all this stuff. But there's nobody listening and nobody cares. So this is why we care about cancellation tokens. Because it would be kind of nice if whenever anybody gave up and closed our, to our, our tab, their tab or our, their, their browser, that we stop processing that request on the server instead of continuing to use that thread that could be doing something else, processing somebody else's request. So that's where they've like brought in a recording of their life story and sat it down on the bench and clicked play and then just walked off and left everybody else standing there in the queue waiting. So at this point, I started to, hand to, to convert this earlier. We've got the client disconnected token, and I should have shown it just then, but if, I, if you look at this token, there's a, prob a Boolean property on it which will be set to true when the client's disconnected. So if we pass this token in, every async method, typically if it supports cancellation, will have an overload which accepts a cancellation token. So we're going to 
to put the token in, and we're going to do that. Okay. So now we've given all of these asynchronous tasks our token. Let's make that much longer, shall we? This didn't seem to be long enough. So now let's run our, let's do our test again. If we've run our app, we might put this over here, put this over here. We can run through this one, that's fine. Okay, open up another tab. Okay, we're going to take our dashboard and we're going to put it in here. So now I'm going to load, I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to have be over here, I'm going to hit F5, and as soon as I hit F5, I'm going to close this tab. Right? Done. As if by magic, my request stops, and now there's nothing happening on my server anymore. I'm just leaving it for a little while to prove that it's not just going to get there after three seconds. Okay, so at this point, now, um, where it actually stopped processing is interesting. So if I was like Jedi fast and I managed to close that tab whilst it was still doing this get string, it would never have done anything after that, none of this work. What's more likely is that whilst it was in this task.delay here, I actually closed the tab, which, which is why it would never got to this breakpoint here that we've got set. So using this token, you can handle the fact that people close down your browser without continuing to block your, your, AS, your process at the thread, your request thread. Okay? Now, the other thing I talked about was the other tokens that we have, right? There's, there was a timeout token and an async token. And one of the things that you're going to want to look at at some point, if I can stop, one of the things you're going to want to look at is, well, how do I pass all those tokens in? I want to be able to stop processing whenever any of those conditions go wrong. So what you do then is we go var source equals new token source, cancellation token source dot, sorry, I don't need a new. I just need cancellation token source dot create linked token source. Okay, what this will create us is we give it a bunch of tokens and it will give us back a token that represents all three of those. And if any of them are tripped, it'll trip that one. Okay? So we're going to say we're going to put in here response.client disconnected token, the one that we've got already. And then we're going to go request dot timeout token. And then there was another one, it was the async one. That's actually a little bit different. The async timeout token is actually passed into our func. One of the overloads of page in async task is a func that accepts a variable, which is the async timeout token. So if we just accept that in there, then we can pass it in here, and we'll have it to be used as part of our token source. Now we can change our token to actually be source.token instead of just one of the tokens. So this token property now gives me back a cancellation token, which is going to set the variable to true. So if we can run this once more, um, when we hit our breakpoint, this has an is cancellation requested. Uh, you can't see that. It has is cancellation requested equals true. Okay, and that will be set to true on the token that comes back from the source whenever any one of those cancellation tokens that we pass in is set, set to true, which is how all of the underlying async plumbing is going to take care of cancelling their tasks. Okay, so let's switch back. So cancellation tokens can further refuse to thread usage so that when something needs to fail, it fails fast and it cancels the request that's happening on the server. ASP.NET has some built-in cancellation tokens that you can use, and you can use a cancellation token source to combine those tokens. That's the three things that you kind of need to remember there. So let's talk a little bit about parallelism. We said that you can do parallelism with, a, with async and await and, uh, in um, ASP.NET. Now, if we could look, go back to our analogies, if using asynchronous programming was like a restaurant versus a post office, then parallelism is more like a pit stop. We're going to throw as much stuff at something as we can. We're going to do everything at once until we get it done. We're going to, re to reduce the overall time that it takes to get our thing done. So there's two types of wa two ways you can kind of do parallelism with async and await. You do two or more awaitable operations. In this case, you're not using any additional threads on the server. You're just awaiting two things at once. So this is kicking off my database call, kicking off my service call, awaiting both of them. I'm not using a new thread, but the thread that kicked off those two calls is, can now process other things whilst I wait for those to come back. 
It's parallelism in that you're waiting for two things at the same time, or multiple things at the same time, multiple I.O. calls. The other is to do multiple synchronous operations. This is like task.run or threadpool.q user item. This is, this is more the scenario that you're used to dealing with thinking about, which is where you end up with more threads on the server executing all these things. This is what people think of when they think of multi-threading and things like that and parallelism traditionally. And remember that in ASP.NET, there's only one thread pool, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So if we come back here, if we switch back to our, to our talk, this thing is kind of, we're doing two I.O. operations here. So it seems to make sense that instead of waiting, doing this synchronously, Instead of waiting asynchronously for these two tasks synchronously, which means we're waiting for one to be finished and then waiting for the next, why don't we just kick them both off, wait until they're both finished, and then do our stuff? All right? So this is what we're going to do here with parallelism. So let's move this up to here. Let's move our code that handles this down. Okay, now what we can do here is say, we can say, instead of awaiting here, we just take away the await. And then our quote JSON variable and our RSX variable, RSSXML variable is going to contain the task of string. And then what we can do is we can just await them both. Let's just go await. We could just put await here, right? Twice. Quote JSON. We can go await RSXXML. XML like this. However, there's a slightly more efficient and more readable, I think. I'm all about being readable and expressing the intent. Be able to go task.whenall, quote JSON, and RSSXML. Now, this is going to say when all of the tasks that you've been given are completed, complete the task that when all returns. So we want to await that task, whatever it is. Okay? So now, execution is going to come in here, it's going to come down. It's going to kick these two tasks off, then, it's going to, then here it's going to say, okay, now you can have the thread back. And then when both of these tasks are complete, then we'll come back. Okay? Then, well, now down here, the reason we have these build errors is because this doesn't accept a, quote, a task, it accepts a string. So what we're going to do is, we know that the, these two tasks are complete now because they've just been completed, so we're just going to use the result of them both. And it's a strongly typed because it's generic, generic task, so they know that these results are of type string, if you can zoom in. Okay, so now we're doing both tasks at the same time. And if we execute our page, we should see that before we were taking about, what was about 200 milliseconds to run, the first one's going to be a bit slower, but after that, well, we're down to just over 100 milliseconds to run. So we've reduced the overall page load, the page load time by doing parallelism, like classic parallelism. But, all we've, but we haven't used up any extra servers on the, th any extra threads on the server. We haven't said spawn up a new thread, go do some database, spawn up a new thread, go do some IO, and just sit there and use up my request thread. We've just said we've only ever had one thread throughout the course of this. Okay, well, it's technically not true. We may have multiple threads when we come back, but it's not really important. We haven't used up more threads from the resource pool. Okay? Now, which is an important distinction, because as I said earlier, the thread pool, there is only one thread pool in ASP.NET, which means every time you do something that causes a new thread to be launched here that comes from the thread pool, like task.run, you're just taking another thread away that could have been used to process requests that now you're using to do something in the background, which you have to be very careful of doing. Okay, so now what we can do is let's switch back and just talk briefly about some of that stuff we just saw. You can reduce your request time, but the other thing to be careful of is that, as I just said, threads come from the same pool used to serve requests. So if you do synchronous parallelism, which is basically task.run or something that's going to cause a thread, like explicitly cause a thread to be spawned to do something, you're taking resources away from ASP.NET that it would otherwise be using to process the incoming pages, which is going to slow down your server more. So you'd only do it if you're actually going to need to do it. The way that I just showed you doesn't do that, so you're okay. 
The other thing to be careful of here is that, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on as well, is that what I've done here is I've one request on my web server became two requests to those two services, the RSS XML and the quote XML. If you're doing five things in your page load, then what, and you do the same parallelism that we just done, one request becomes five requests going out. If all of those five where your services are all on the same server, every one hit to your page causes five hits to that, data, that server. So you've said, sweet, my server runs real fast, but you're going to absolutely destroy that server that you're asking for resources from. Might be fine if that's not your server. As long as, as, long as there's some agreement that they're going to keep it fast. Right. But if you're, run, if you're running all these servers, if it's your database server, it's your web server, it's your, you, your, service, your server hosting your other services that you're calling, doing this sort of parallelism potentially means that you're just going to absolutely flood those servers with other work. So you might just be kicking the problem further along with parallelism. The classic scenario where this really makes sense, this type of parallelism, is when like your intranet dashboard type scenario. I've got a dashboard, five people actually want to read the reports on my dashboard. It needs to make requests to 60 different things to be able to combine all the data onto one dashboard. Parallelism there makes sense, right? The only, there's only going to be five users and they want it to load instantly because they're the five important users that pay the checks probably or pay the, pay the bills. So you want to be able to make that page fast and you can do that with this sort of parallelism. You do it relatively safety because there's a small user count. You're not going to get thousands of people asking for 60 things which is going to completely fan out and wipe out your network. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about HTTP handlers. So the other thing that I have in this project, which I didn't show you before, is a HTTP handler. And if you have a look here, HTTP handlers, in case any of you haven't used them, are just a way for you to register a class which can handle incoming file types. In my case, I've registered this mybiz.info handler class. What it does, anything that has .info, ASP.NET's going to call it to process that, that .info file. Right? It's one of these for like ASPX files, for example. There'll be a handler. It'll handle it. If it's ASPX, give it to the ASPX handler that knows how to, what to do with it. In my case, I have this info handler. It implements iHTTP handler, and it processes requests. And what it does is it assumes that the dot info is going to the dot info's file name is going to be a zip code. It's going to validate my zip code, and then it's going to write some HTML manually out to the out to the pay out to the response. So I've got these create fact section and create various section methods, and they just go and download some data and they write it out to the HTML stream as well. Okay, go get some data, write it out to the screen. That's all these three methods are really doing. Now, if I run this, if I run my app. And then I can go, well, let's just use Internet Explorer. That's what it's there for. HTTP localhost. Let's go 98052, which is the zip code of Redmond, where I live. And have I, is that being cut off on your screen? Has slightly? How's that? I won't maximize things. <laughs> the 98052, some interesting facts, there's some general information, there's some weather. So I have one page here, it's making three requests, it's getting three bits of data back from my zip code in a HTTP handler. So what we're going to look at now is, the obvious thing here is I'm doing three I.O. bound tasks. And I want to reduce the overall speed of my page. I'm going to do those three tasks asynchronously and parallel. And I'm going to then speed up everything. So I've already created, you already know how to make async methods at this point. We had async, we had a task, we put an put a async method in there. So I've already created async versions of all these tasks. So the first thing we talk about is how do I make a HTTP handler asynchronous? Well, there is an I uh, async HTTP handler, uh, I HTTP async handler. You can implement this class. It's a little bit complicated. You have to implement these begin process and request end requests. And you also have to implement the IHTTP handler stuff that I've already implemented in this one. It's a little bit annoying. It's not too bad. But we have actually given you an, AS, an async HTTP handler base class. Okay? So you can HTTP task async handler. And then to implement that, we instead of doing the public void here, we're going to go uh, override. And we're going to need async, it needs to be task process request. Okay. Now, my, oh, I also 
have to follow the actual conventions, put async at the end of process request async. And now I should have just the squiggly line that says, could you please do some async work in here, right? Now, in here then, what I'm going to do is we can, we could just do the await thing in here, right? Do what we've been doing, same as all the time. We just add async to the end here because I've already got async methods of all these requests, like this. Okay, and that would be kind of okay. It would, it would, it would solve the fact that I've, it would solve my sort of performance of my server, but it wouldn't solve the load time of my page as we talked about earlier. So instead, what we're going to do here, we're going to try and create, we're going to go var tasks equals new list, and we're going to create a list of task of string. All right, and we use the object initializer pattern. We're going to go create fact section async. Give it my zip code. Okay. Then we're going to go create info section async. Give it my zip code. Same thing for all these. So we're going to main. So instead of doing this the way we were doing it, I'm actually going to collect all the tasks that I want to complete in a list. Okay. Then what we're going to do instead of over at, instead of um, writing just writing them out afterwards, we're going to write a loop because we're doing multiple of the exact same thing. We're getting a string and we're writing it out to the page. Sounds like a loop. So we're going to go while task.any. So while says anything in my collection, I'm going to await. I'm going to go, well, I'm going to get the task. So I'm going to go var task, var completed task equals await. I'm going to go task dot before we looked at when all. Now we want to look at when any. So when any of my tasks complete, um, this method is going to return the task that was completed when you await. So what actually happens is, is that task.whenAny gives you back a task, and its result is the task that it completed. So when we await here, our completed task is equal to whichever one of these three up here is just finished. Could be any three of them because we fire them all off at the same time. Depends on which one comes back first. So then what we do is we'll remove that task from the list so that our loop actually completes. I forgot to do that a fairly large number of times when practicing for this. And then, after that, we're going to say, so we've got our completed task, we're going to remove it from the list, and then we need to write it out to the screen, so we're going to go context dot uh, response dot write, same as what we were doing before, and we just need to write the result. We know it's completed because it's just said it's completed, so we're going to go completed task dot result to get the string that we want to write back. Okay? And then, if we build, we should be able to come over here and go HTTP, localhost, go to 98052, okay, and we get our page back. Okay, and it's gone down to 16 milliseconds, which was uh, uh, six to 1.6 seconds. It was a lot slower before I forgot to leave the page up. Now, if we, if one, the other thing that we can do here, though, that might be cool is we could go context.response, dot flush. So what we want to do here is we're saying, hey, that's just cool, it's in parallel and all that, but well, I'm still making them wait for the whole time before, like the longest thing before they can display. So instead, we're going to make it so that when I refresh the page, the data appears as it comes back instead of just waiting for that one long task to complete. And I'm like, you know what, I like this async thing, this thing's kind of good. I want to make everything asynchronous. I want, to, I want our flush to be asynchronous as well. Everything, everything async all the time, right? Now the problem with that is there is no async version of flush. Well, there is, but it's not called flush async. Instead, what we have is we have begin flush and we have end flush. This is the 1.1 asynchronous pattern that we saw at the start of the talk presentation. Now, luckily for us, the people that implemented this stuff knew a little bit about the history of asynchronous uh, async code in .NET, so they have implemented a tar, they've implemented task.factory.fromAsync. From async accepts the begin and the end method and it returns you a .NET async and awaitable task from that old pattern of doing asynchronous programming. So we go from here, we go context.response.begin flush, and then we give it context.response.end flush, not end, that would be terrible. 
And it also accepts another parameter, which is like some context that you can provide to the method that you're doing. There's a bunch of overloads for that last, those last parameters to control the task. In our case, it's pretty simple. We just want to call a method with no parameters, so we're not going to worry about that. And then we're going to await on the task. And that's it. And then over here, we can refresh our page, and we are asynchronous all the time, and everything displays to the other page as it does. Making the flash asynchronous doesn't help our overall page load or anything like that. It's just asynchronous. In fact, it was really just a convenient way to show you the task stop from async, because it's kind of cool and important to know if you end up needing to use that type of code. OK? So now, we're going to switch back to slides for a little bit. We're going to talk about some tips, some tricks, and some things to definitely not do. I'm going to walk off the noisy stage. Okay. Now, avoid work on background threads, in quotation marks. Because in ASP.NET, there are no background threads on the server. This is the situation we talked about earlier. You're going to destroy the place that you connect to if you start spawning up lots and lots of things to connect, lots of lots of threads to talk to. You're going to destroy your server, sorry, if you start spawning up lots of threads. So that's why through this entire talk, the only thing we've talked about has been I/O. If your task is not I/O bound, if it is CPU bound in that it's not talking to any remote resource, it's just doing something like crunching some numbers, converting some JPEGs, doing something like that. Using async and await on that is just causing another thread on the same server to be doing the work. You might as well just have left the first thread doing it. All you've done is said to my request thread, you go back and process some more requests, but I'm going to take another thread that could have been servicing requests anyway, and I'm going to use it to do the work. And then I'm going to hand it back to the thread that I cast for in the first time, and then I'm going to like all you're doing is switching threads for no reason. In fact, you probably hurt your perf more than anything. You're, like, you're just going to hurt it because there is a slight overhead in doing some of this async work. In the case of I.O., it's always better than, because the I.O. is always slower than that, that hit. In the case of CPU, all you're doing is adding an extra task, that didn't, adding extra work that didn't need to be done before. So the other thing is you can use task off from result if the result that you're returning needs to look like it's asynchronous, but it's not. So your scenario here is if you've got an if statement, and if that statement is true, you want to return just a number. Let's say you've got an integer. If, if I've got this cached, return 3, I like return my cached value. Otherwise, do some asynchronous work to get that data back. And you can use from a from result, task off from result, which will give you a task that looks like it's been done, but it just like returns the value. Okay, so that way you don't have to special case any of your calling code. It can all be the same. Uh, sorry, the last point was you can use the task for completion source to get a faulted task if you need to error out the, error, error out the um, tokens. Okay, so HTTP context.current, the request, the response, and all the other ASP.NET intrinsics can work, but only if you start awaiting on the request that starts the actual initial request thread. ASP.NET can't take care of doing the intrinsic stuff for you if you spawn a new thread and then start doing a wait on that thread. Okay? So the solution to that is just use async and await all the time <laughs> from the beginning all the way through, and then you'll be okay. Don't like, so don't do task.run, get a new thread, then do async and await, and expect to be able to do context.response.write or something like that. It's just not going to work. Now, if you do find yourself in a situation where you are on a background thread and you do need to do something like that, use synchronization context or post. That's what we do anyway for you. Okay? Avoid using task.wait. Anybody who was in my talk earlier today saw me use task.wait. Don't ever use task.wait. Unless you're in the situation I was in, which is a dodgy demo app for Honor to show you some other code in a console application. The reason that you don't want to use task.wait is that task.wait is blocking. It is not asynchronous, which means whatever thread you call task.wait on will be blocked until that task completes. In the case of ASP.NET, ASP that means that the request thread will now stop. It will not service any more requests until whatever that asynchronous work you've done is completed. And to make it even worse, if you do it in ASP.NET, you're almost guaranteed to deadlock ASP.NET. 
in which case your page will never ever return. So use await or use task when all. And in fact, it's so easy to deadlock ASP.NET that I'm going to show you how. If we go back to my standard static default.aspx page, I've got this do stuff method. Private async task do stuff. And all it does is await on a task delay, right? It's asynchronous delaying like I showed you earlier. So over here, if we go register async task, new page async, this is the same way that we registered our async before, right? Except I don't want to register ape that. Page async task. Then async, I'm just going to give it another func, and we're going to say register inside our inside of our task, all we're going to do is say do stuff. And then the task that gets returned from that, we're just going to wait on it. Like this. Seems simple enough, right? Just wait for the delay. And then the page will go. Yes? But the problem is, is that ASP.NET is now deadlocked. Because the request thread is now blocked waiting for task.wait. And the task thread is now trying to take care of the fact that you need to be able to use ASP.NET intrinsics from when using async and await. And they're both waiting for the same thing that's never going to complete. It's a classic deadlock scenario. Right? And it's the re this happens because we've done all that work for you to be able to do context.request.write, regardless of where you're at with your async and await keywords. It also messes with your call stack and does all sorts of terrible things. So uh, avoid the use of task.wait in ASP.NET, if at all possible. Use any of the other, <laughs> any of the other asynchronous ways of doing things. Avoid task.continue with. Continue with is not aware of synchronization context. It always puts you on a new thread, explicitly. So you end up on a new thread, and all the problems with ending up on a new thread apply. If you haven't done async and await, you're going to end up on a new thread, no stuff. And it's also just completely unaware of synchronization context, so it means not only you're on a new thread, but you can't use synchronization context.post to get back to be able to do anything that requires you to be on the request thread. Use async and await, because async and await's great. Now, be careful with parallelism, because this is the one we talked about earlier. Multiple requests times multiple threads equals lots of stuff. All threads come from the same thread pool, and threads consume a minimum of about a quarter of a megabyte of memory. So if you're kicking off multiple threads on your server, all of them are doing stuff, that's a quarter of a meg every single time you do that thread. without without the memory from your application or anything that you're doing taken into account. Okay, just a quarter of a meg just to have the thread. So that is, means that fairly quickly, if you are actually spinning up new threads, you can run out of memory on your server. And you've got to think about this. This is ASP.NET. Like, Scott Hanselman's going to tweet your website, right, because he thinks it's cool. He's got 50,000 people that click everything he ever tweets. Okay, and if you're spinning up lots of threads in your page load, your website's going to go down. Right? Uh, uh, Stephen Fry on Twitter is exactly the same. I remember him seeing a, uh, someone sending me a tweet from him where he said, I'm sorry, every time I tweet about a charity, their website goes down. Because every time he tweets, 100,000 people that are following click, and it just overloads every web server that he ever puts a URL for on his Twitter stream. So... And also, the websites are also going to go down because they're not using async and await, which means every one of those 100,000 people that all click that link at the exact same second are all blocking a thread whilst that page loads. And that's 100,000 threads on their server, 100,000 quarter of megs of memory without any of the memory that's being used by actual application doing stuff. Right? And if there are any, so unless they're all static HTML with no I.O. happening in the background, it's going to be really, really hard to keep that server up under that sort of load. And that's the sort of situation where you want to start looking at this sort of async. Don't use thread local storage. You may swap physical threads. Okay? If we go back to our HTTP handler, okay, and we put a breakpoint here, Let's put a breakpoint here, actually. I probably need to do this for you all. 
Okay. Now, if we run here and we connect to our HTTP handler, so we go 98052.info. There's just no data for any other zip codes, by the way. That's why I keep using Redmond. Um, if we now, if you look at the top of the page here, this is the thread location, right? The ID. If I start stepping through here, down here into task.wenany, you'll see it starts to change. Yeah? Because you can jump around all over the place when doing async. So suddenly now you've just gone, we've just had two different ones, like well, there's, there's another one. Every single time we do this loop, we're on a different thread. Okay, so if you use anything <laughs> that requires you to be on the same thread or is thread specific, then it's not necessarily going to work. In fact, it probably won't. You just saw we just kept jumping around all over the place. Okay, so don't use thread local storage, don't use thread static. Use HTTP context.items. If you're using async and await, asp.net will take care of the thread hops for you. So you just put stuff in there and away you go. Don't assume that it doesn't apply to your synchronous code as well. If you're doing anything that might be using asynchronous code under the covers, you might end up, they might end up switching threads as well. So it can be dangerous, especially as more and more stuff goes to async. ASP.NET, not in the current version of Visual Studio 2013, but very, very soon, ASP.NET will release an update which will scaffold all MVC controllers and everything to use async by default. So, so the next version, probably the next, probably the RTM of Visual Studio, when you create a new MVC application, it's async. And it's using EF async when you scaffold EF controllers and stuff like that. Okay, so it's good to be aware of some of these situations. And it's obviously only going to use async on the I.O. operations that it scaffolds by default, but they're still going to, it's going to scaffold async code. Now don't call fire and forget methods. Fire and forget methods are basically something that returns task and you just don't, or something that returns void where you never actually keep, you can't have an async void method where you just fire it and then you never do anything with the task or never just, just ignore it. Um, so the reason for this is that ASP.NET could at any time decide to clean everything up and your, the whole request and everything spawned from the request will be shut down, which means that your fire and forget task will go away. And if you really, really don't care whether it completed or not, that might be okay. But usually if you actually are trying to do background processing, you don't really want to do that, just fire off a task and forget about it. You really want to do something like, if it's simple, use Web Backgrounder, which is a NuGet package, or set up a proper web worker role to be able to do a long-running processing on a web server. Don't just like spawn off an async task and then let it go, because ASP.NET will go find it and kill it for you if enough conveniently. Okay. So use the HTTP ace task async handler if you want to use a t if you're going to use HTTP handlers, because as we saw, the IHTTP async handler is just kind of com like just harder to do. The base class is better, override one method, and away you go. Here's some resources on async that we threw in here. Parallel programming blogging.net, which has got a bunch of stuff about async and pro programming. The asynchrony in.net white paper is that second link. That's where I got the samples from. So the bit of code that done the summing up of the data and, the, and then all the conversion to the massive monstrous TPL code and then the bringing it back to the async code, that's in there. And then the ASP.NET async tutorial is a tutorial online which has an MVC app and a web app and a bunch of stuff like that, all non-async with instructions on how to convert the whole application into async. So you can go through that tutorial if you want to just like, convert an existing app over to async for you. Okay, and that's... That's it for me. Questions with async can get very complicated, so feel free to yell them out, but also everyone can just come up if you want to talk to me about it. There is, an I, there is a separate ISS thread pool, but when you're in an ASP.NET context, you're always going to end up with the threads from the one thread pool that handles your requests. Okay. If you can get access to it, yes. It's just not very easy. But it's, typically it doesn't make 
typically no, because there's still resources on the same machine. Anyway, um, so I'll just before people are leaving, because not everybody stays for question time, thank you very much for coming and spending your second last session at TechEd with me. Fill out your eval forms. They're important to control what type of content appears at TechEd, um, as well as telling people whether or not I'm any good at doing this thing. Um, thank you very much.